Welcome, my beautiful people, to another episode of Dino Basics, where we dig up the basics and solve our favorite deceased beasts. My name is Logan, and for the first time in a good while, we take to the skies to learn about an early flying creature with a head as big as its Jurassic reputation. It's the two-toothed high flyer, Dimorphodon. The earliest remains of Dimorphodon date back to 1828, owed to famed paleontologist Mary Anning, probably the most well-known female paleontologist of all time, and an expert in Jurassic fossil remains from the English Channel. And this fossil was no different, being discovered at the Lyme Regis Formation in Dorset, UK. This original specimen, which would go on to become the holotype for the genus, consisted of a partial skeleton locked in a slab of stone, but notably lacked a skull for the creature. These remains would be sent off to paleontologist William Buckland, who in 1829 would describe the creature in a report as a new species of the Pterodactylus genus, naming the creature Pterodactylus macronix. Important to note, Pterodactylus, now understood as a fairly small pterosaur measuring about three and a half feet or about a meter in wingspan, was often used to group many early pterosaurs throughout the 1800s, similar to how many medium-sized theropods were simply grouped under the Megalosaurus genus for the first few decades of paleontology. Moving into the 1850s, Buckland and other paleontologists would note how diverse the Pterodactylus genus was becoming, and began splitting the genus into separate genera. For Dimorphodon, this split would come in 1858, as paleontologist Richard Owen would recover two new specimens, which both included skulls and their distinct appearance from Pterodactylus encouraged Owens to create a new genus for these specimens. Landing on the name Dimorphodon in 1859. From this point onward, the genus and specimens associated with it would remain fairly muted, excluding a few new specimens being recovered over the following two centuries, as well as a new species, the Dimorphodon Weintraubi, being described in 1998, before being removed some time later. The name Dimorphodon has its roots in Greek, including the words di, meaning two, morphe, meaning form, and odon, meaning tooth, having the name directly translate to two-form tooth. This translation is in reference to Dimorphodon's jaws sporting two different forms of teeth, scientifically referred to as a heterodont. This is opposed to many reptiles, who instead only sport a single tooth type of the same shape and size throughout their mouth, inversely called a homodont. As for their species name Macronyx, this also stems from Greek, including Macros for large and Onyx for claw, directly translating to large claw. Again, fairly self-explanatory, this is a direct reference to a large claw they would wield on either hand. Despite their reptilian appearance and existence during the Mesozoic, Dimorphodon is not actually a dinosaur. Instead, they are a member of the Pterosauria grouping of reptiles, often simply referred to as pterosaurs. The pterosaurs were flying reptiles that first appeared in the late Triassic, and are believed to be the earliest vertebrates to evolve powered flight, around 220 million years ago. And by the time of their extinction, nearly 66 million years ago, some pterosaurs had grown to become the largest organisms to ever take to the skies, such as the colossal Quetzalcoatlus, which would sport a wingspan of nearly 36 feet or 12 meters in length, and could grow to nearly 500 pounds in weight, capable of hunting even dinosaurs during their reign. More specific to Dimorphodon, it would be the namesake of its own family of pterosaurs, called the Dimorphodontidae, a fairly limited classification of primitive pterosaurs hailing from the late Triassic as well as the early Jurassic. 
While a number of additional genera have been proposed for the family, the only seemingly definitive inclusions are Dimorphodon and the fellow bulky skulled Caelus Tiventus, a Triassic pterosaur which, while small among the later pterosaurs, was possibly the largest of its time. It would sport a wingspan of nearly five and a half feet, or about a meter and a half in length. As for Dimorphodon, this creature was also a fairly small pterosaur, wielding a wingspan of only about five feet, or around a meter and a half. The enlarged skull of Dimorphodon is certainly the most eye-catching feature of this pterosaur, sporting a taller and more rounded head opposed to the thinner and more narrow skulls of many other pterosaurs. This skull would be around 9 inches, or about 20 centimeters in length, and despite its size, was fairly lightweight, owed to the many large openings the skull would sport, separated by small, bony partitions. Many artistic interpretations choose to illustrate Dimorphodon similar to modern-day puffins, with a thick beak covering the front half of their skulls, and even including the bright oranges and reds these birds flaunt today. While superficially, Dimorphodon was similar to puffins in general skull construction, there is no direct evidence of this, and some argue this depiction may be disingenuous, as much of what makes up the deep cranial profile for a puffin's bill is actually soft tissue, as opposed to the more bony structure of Dimorphodon. Although, if I'm honest, I'll take this flamboyant penguin with a pilot's license design over the chimera-looking things we got in Jurassic World. As I alluded to before, Dimorphodon has the unique trait of sporting two teeth types in their jaws. The front of their upper jaws would have four or five fang-like structures, while the rest of their mouths would be lined with smaller, flatter teeth. This variety of teeth, alongside their advanced jaw musculature, hints at a specialization in so-called snap-and-hold feeding methods, where the jaws of Dimorphodon could close extremely quickly to catch prey, but lacked much force or tooth penetration. Their bodies, in comparison to their unusually large heads, were fairly small, and ended with relatively thin yet muscular hind limbs. Their forelimbs were also thin, but were considerably longer owed to their fleshy wings, which would provide them with the ability of flight. The wings of Dimorphodon, and all pterosaurs for that matter, were formed by a single finger extending significantly further from the hand and body, with a thin layer of skin extending backwards from this finger and the rest of their arm. Unlike birds, whose fingers over time have fused into their arm bones, pterosaurs would have the rest of their fingers extend outward near the midpoint of their wings to allow these creatures to walk quadrupedally on the ground, balancing on these unusual hands. And in Dimorphodon's case, the third finger would be significantly longer than the others, but still nothing compared to their fourth winged finger. Unlike many later pterosaurs, Dimorphodon would sport a fairly long tail relative to its body. Its unique construction indicated the first few vertebrae would be short and flexible, allowing the creature to easily control the rest of its tail, while the later vertebrae would be much longer and more stiff, ensuring the tail does not flail around while flying. While unconfirmed, it is believed this tail would end in a tail vein, a small section of skin that would flatten out to provide better maneuverability while airborne. Dimorphodon is believed to have lived during the early Jurassic period, between 200 and 190 million years ago. Remains seem to be limited to specific regions around the modern-day United Kingdom. Geological evidence shows the UK and the rest of Great Britain during this time would still be an island, but likely much smaller and divided among many smaller archipelagos, intercut with warm, shallow seas. These islands would be fairly hot and almost tropical, composed of dense forests and rainforests, 
Many remains from similar formations of Dimorphodon are limited to marine reptiles that would swim between these islands and in the deeper oceans that surround them, such as a dolphin-like ichthyosaurus, which would feed on the rich deposits of fish that populated these waters. Another inhabitant was the long-necked plesiosaurus, who would navigate through these ancient oceans and, depending on if you hated my video on Macaulay and Bembe, is actually still hanging out there now in Loch Ness. As for its terrestrial neighbors, these were likely limited to early theropods like the Sarcosaurus, a predatory creature that could grow to nearly 11 feet or 3.5 meters at full size as well as herbivores like the 13-foot or 4-meter-long Skeletosaurus, an extremely early Thyreophoran, whose armor and spikes would be passed down to later heavily armed herbivores, like the Ankylosaurus and Stegosaurus. The life and hunting style of smaller pterosaurs like Dimorphodon has been debated for some time. Early interpretations believe such creatures would be largely piscivores, flying over long stretches of water to scoop up fish near the ocean's surface, before returning to land to feast on their catch, similar to modern-day seabirds. Yet, more recent studies have found Dimorphodon was not actually a strong flyer, as their relatively short wingspans made gliding for long periods of time difficult. Instead, it has been proposed Dimorphodon would be largely terrestrial and only fly as a last resort for a burst of speed or to reach more higher altitude perch positions, similar to modern fowl or woodpeckers. Further studies of their limbs and claws have shown Dimorphodon was likely quite adept at walking on all fours, folding their front limbs to allow them to balance themselves on their front hands. Their curved forelimb claws further show Dimorphodon was an excellent climber, likely allowing the creature to easily scale trees to chase after prey or avoid ground-based predators. As for their diet, fish was likely a rarity, rather than making up the majority, as previously believed. Their snap-and-hold jaws hint at Dimorphodon being a hunter of small vertebrates and insects, likely preferring to chase after tiny, shrew-like mammals and lizards. It has been proposed that Dimorphodon could be a primarily insectivorous hunter, but many argue the creature was too large to rely entirely on such a buggy diet. With the prestige as an early pterosaur, as well as its bizarre face compared to their thinner counterparts, Dimorphodon has been able to land some recognition in modern media. Aside from smaller appearances like the 2010 documentary Flying with Monsters 3D, the Jurassic World franchise has included the creature in various forms after first appearing in the 2015 film Jurassic World, escaping from their aviary and wreaking havoc on the island. This, you know what, I'll say it, gross and dumb look. Like, come on, look at this concept art. It could have been so much better would unfortunately inspire their appearance across the Jurassic World franchise, including video games like the 2018 Jurassic World Evolution, and later on its 2021 sequel, and 2020's television series Camp Cretaceous, just to name a few. The Dimorphodon, puffin inspired or not, is an eye-catching creature with a fascinating history to boot. From its reputation as an early group member, to the deep insights it has provided into the lifestyle of these smaller pterosaurs, the Dimorphodon has provided the scientific community with tantalizing details about these smaller, not-so-terrifying pterosaurs for decades. And it is almost assured that this creature will continue to die, morph our understanding of the pterosaur grouping for many decades to come. That's good to do for this episode. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to leave a comment below what you think of Dimorphodon, and if you've heard of this creature before the video. I haven't covered a pterosaur since Tupandactylus, which is over a year ago. Crazy to think about. Let me know if there are any other pterosaurs you guys would want to learn the basics on. Although, every single time I put Quetzalcoatlus in a poll, you guys voted down. It's starting to feel personal. 
We are off next week, but the following week, we'll be taking a closer look at the asteroid that ended it all, as we learn of the final days and the aftermath of the Cretaceous asteroid. Thank you for your support, and see you in the next video.